All right. I'm going to get those pineapple smoothies, huh? Not too shab. Not too shab. I see you're enjoying them there. Uh, one more big round of applause for Connor. Yeah, yeah. I will make you a promise. Connor is smarter than me. Yes, that is true. That is true. Okay, so my quick story. My quick story. Anybody know Lewis out of Virginia? Ever heard of it, my man? Okay, we've got one that knows Lewis out of Virginia. Lewis out of Virginia on the Chesapeake Bay. We got any Virginia Marylanders in here? Just so I'm aware of you. Kind of, sort of, were theirs, come here's, and so forth, right? So um, I grew up really in Virginia, but my, my grandparents had a cottage in Lewis out of Virginia. It's a great little place right at the mouth of the Potomac, little village, if you will. And so I grew up on the water, but I didn't do much fishing. They only wanted to do the old spot and croaker thing, and I didn't think it was very exciting, just spot and croakers. You know that deal. You know that deal. That's kind of what the uh, Potomac has, at least in that part of the Potomac. And so I wasn't that into that, uh, into the fishing. I wasn't that into the boating, but I loved the water. Something happened. What happened was I had four kids, and one of them, thank goodness, was a young man. His name is JT. And JT, in 2009, we would go to my cottage, that was the family cottage, and he would get up before everybody else, and he started to fish by himself every single morning. And he was obsessed with it. I could see it very early on. And of course, I don't want to be a lame dad, and so by 2010, what happens, I'm jumping in. And you can see the way that I'm holding the rod. It doesn't look like I'm incredibly experienced there, probably not. But this is when we started to do it literally this was the first time I got up early with him. My wife saw it, so she went out there with us. We started to get interested. Didn't have a boat, didn't have anything. And so our first major purchase was what we call the tank. That is the tank. And I'm telling you what, it was like, and I want you to imagine that boat right there, 12 foot skiff, with a family of six. <laughs> and that's exactly. My wife and four kids and people really looked at us very, very funny as we were going down the river. We didn't go out very far, but this is where my son and I first started to troll together. Didn't know what I was doing. Trolling with an umbrella rig with weights and six feet of water because I had no idea what was going on, right? But just enjoying myself the whole way, right? And so we started to do this more, and I realized we, we better get a little bit bigger of a boat. And so I still didn't really know how to manage a boat. And so by 2013, we purchased this little dual console bay liner, 16-footer. And we started to experience more freedom. And my son really started to notice that little low. We got, he started to get good with the cast net, and we just really began to embrace it all. And I wanted to go out further. And he wanted to go out further. And so that's when we started going out to the Chesapeake Bay in a little 16-foot dual console. And that's when my wife said, I want you to bring back my son, and so it might be time to purchase something else. And so we started to get into it more and more. By January of 2014, this is the day that we received our boat. Now, again, didn't know much about boats. This happened to be a sea hunt, a little 23-foot um, walk around. My son was so excited that day that it showed up that he wanted to wear his summer clothing. And so we put on our so summer clothing together, we went out to the boat, and we took this photo here. And of course, now we've started to get a little bit more serious. This was 2016, the boy's starting to grow. It's a little details too, if you notice. If you like to fish, you notice we ran into them, and we ran into them hard, right? Especially when you've got a couple 40 inchers, and you've got a bunch of others, and you still got lines out, and just what a magical moment this was for us. We had, had that big goal. We wanted to catch a 40-inch rockfish. This was just the one goal that we had. We had never done it, and then we got two at the exact same time. And this was the moment that it happened, and you see his joy. But then we said, all right, we've kind of got the whole rockfish thing, but I want more. And so where am I today? Well, my son and I want to do that, but the problem is the boat that we have isn't going to do that. Certainly not in Virginia where you've got to run out 70 miles to get to where the main fish are. So 
As I speak to you today, I, I literally speak to you as your customer. I am that guy that researches boats all the time. I absolutely, now some of you are saying, okay, now I'm going to take this guy seriously. If anything, I'll have a conversation with him later so I can send it to my salesperson. Yeah, sure. No problem. No problem. I research boats at least an hour a week because I know at some point I'm going to buy one. And the great thing is, is over the past year or so, I've become involved in the boating industry, which is far and away my favorite industry, as you could imagine. But when I say these things today, they come from the lens of the sales and marketing person, but also from the lens of the buyer that loves what you do as much as you love what you do. And so I see the world in terms of the buyer. So that's the foundation. So let's get into it. All right, I'm going to find this phrase, zero moment of truth, and then the smartest person in the room, other than Joan, who's heard me talk about this about three times already, right? The smartest person in the room is going to tell me the relationship between 70% and zero moment of truth. Okay, so here we go. Zero moment of truth is the first time a prospect contacts you and you know they exist. So it could be the moment that they fill out a form on your website, or it could be the moment that you meet them at some type of show. It could be the moment that they walk into your retail location, but it's the moment you now know they might want to do business with you. And if you're a supplier, same deal. It's the moment you now know they might want to buy from you. Same deal. So who can tell me the relationship between 70% and zero moment of truth? And this has to do with the way buyers have changed. Patrick? Suspect. Suspect. What do you mean by that? They might want to buy from you, might not. Good, I like it. Anybody else have a guess? Come on. We're all going to become good friends in 90 minutes, I promise. Don't you worry. Like Grant here, he's looking down. He thinks, that'll work if I look down. Yeah, <laughs> so what does it mean? If we don't know this number, because this is the greatest shift that's happened with the buyer over the last 100 years. My man, go ahead. 70% already know the product. Yeah, what's your name, bud? Barrett, good job, brother. So this is, this is what all the studies have shown. And in the B2C space, it's actually higher. This is a B2B study, so B2C is higher. This is what we know, that today on average, 70% of the buying decision has been made before zero moment of truth. On average, in every industry in the world, 70% of the buying decision has been made before they call you, before they contact you, certainly before they walk into your retail location. Now, some of you are saying, I don't think it's like that in my space, Marcus. I think you might be right, because I promise you, Hill, it's either higher or lower than 70%. <laughs> some of you got it. Some of you got it. You're coming around. You'll come around. But this much, I'm sure we can all agree upon. If we went back 15 years and we said, what percentage of the buying decision was made before someone talked to a salesperson? 15, 20 years ago. What do you think that number would have been? Anybody go, come on. 30. Yeah, 25, 30%. So we do know this, it was going to be, or it was much lower than it is today. So 15 years ago, we're 25, 30%. Today, we're at 70%. So the question is, for each and every one of us, is where this number, where's it going to go over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? Where's it going to go? We know this, it's not going to go back. Not going to go back. This is the rising tide that doesn't fall. And so that begs a few questions, doesn't it? Like, for example, if this number's true, and again, we have to accept that it is, which department of your organization, and let's just assume that you have these two departments, I'm sure you do in some way, shape, or form, which department of your organization has a greater impact on the actual sale? Is it the sales department or is it the marketing department? Which one? Come I mean, on, you said it so softly, like you're almost afraid. Which department? Marketing. Yet notwithstanding, generally speaking, when we're in financial trouble, the first department that gets laid off is marketing. That's how we pay them back for their goodness, right? Yeah, score. And generally speaking, when we're looking to grow the organization, the first department that gets hired is sales. So the question is, why is it that way? Why? What do you think? Phil, what do you think? I have no idea. He's got no idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're getting there, Phil. You do have an idea. You've been in the game for a while, right? So, so if we look at this, we've always been able to attach a name of a salesperson next to a sale. And so we've said 
we have attribution. But today, if somebody vets you to death, digitally speaking, right? They come in, and you've seen this. You've probably experienced it yourself if you're selling still. They come into your showroom, or they call your office, and they say, I know what I want. And they tell you exactly what they want. And at that point, you're pretty much an order taker. Now, in that moment, what percentage of the sale did the salesperson actually influence? Probably not much, right, Chris? Not much. Yet, so many of us are still tracking it this way. Here's what's cool. Never in the history of the world can you and I definitively track the revenue that marketing is generating like we can today, especially if we use the right tools. That's really, really fun. Because we don't have to do this shotgun marketing approach like we did for years where we asked ourselves, is it actually working? I'm spending a lot of money on it, but is it driving sales and revenue for the company? We don't have to do that anymore. This is going to be foundational for our conversation today. We've got to accept that this shift has happened and that it's only going to continue and it's going to get very interesting. And so you say to yourself, well, if 70% of the decision is made before they come into my showroom and before they contact my company, I better have a great website. Okay, sure. Let's roll with that for a second. So as a buyer, as a consumer, how would you define the phrase great website? Anybody, come on. How would you define it? Easy to navigate, easy to navigate, somebody said, visually appealing. So what does it mean when we say easy to navigate? That's the number one answer. What does that mean to you? Fewer clicks. Get what you need. Yeah, Scott, you said fewer clicks, yeah. and I want to, I want it, and I want it when? Now. now. And that is the essence of a great buying experience today. Because here's what's fascinating, and everybody participate with this. How many of you have grown more impatient as you shop brick and mortar today versus where you were just a few years ago? How many have grown more impatient shopping brick and mortar? Just look around the room. You want to walk in and you want to get there quicker than you ever have before. Because the idea of a great buying experience today, and what's fascinating, this is marketing, this is sales, and this is customer service, is can I get it, but can I get it fast? Can I get it now? But the struggle for many of us is what is the it that they want? Because how many things could somebody want to know when they come to your website right now? How many questions could they possibly have? Now that is a tough number, and it's a big number, but it's what we're going to talk about today. Because this is the shift that we've all got to accept as well. Now, my quick story. Can anybody tell me what type of in-ground swimming pool this is? In other words, what's it made out of? Does anybody know? You should know this. You should not gunite, but I'll take it as a compliment. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Not gunite. That is a fiberglass pool. Come on, you boaters. We got to know this. We got to stick together. Yeah, this is a fiberglass swimming pool, and this is one of about 1,300 fiberglass swimming pools. My company, River Pools and Spas, has installed throughout Virginia and Maryland. And so, yes, you are talking to a pool guy today. Feeling pretty good about that, right? So it's like, well done, MLA. Nice. Brought on the pool guy. <laughs> but we got a lot of similarities, don't we? As you're going to see. So I started this company in 2001, pretty much right out of college. And things were going okay. We were growing the business up until this particular date and number. What's that date and number represent? Come on, you should all know this. Come on, what's it represent? Day of the crash, what's the bottom number? Yes, the Dow, Patrick. Good or bad day for pool guys? Good or bad day for boating, guys and gals? Not so great. Because within, literally for me, within 48 hours of this day, we had five people that had put down a deposit on a pool. They withdrew that deposit, and they said, we just can't do it. So we lost a quarter of a million dollars in the first 48. Our average pool is about $50,000. Now, I know for some of you that might not be a lot, but for any pool guy, trust me, that's a huge loss, especially going into the off season. And over the coming weeks and months, things got worse and worse. And by January of 2009, we're literally going over the proverbial edge. I talked to three consultants that month, and all three said the same thing. Marcus, you should file bankruptcy. But the problem was, if I filed, as you know, I was going to lose my home, 
my two business partners would have lost their homes. My 16 employees would have lost their jobs. This was the most stressful time of my life. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about right now. This was the time in my life that when I got home from work, my wife didn't ask, how was your day? Because she already knew. Now, of course, we got back over that edge. And the story that is River Pools has now been featured in multiple business books and publications. It's actually taught in college universities today as courses, the River Pools case study. I don't tell you that to brag. I tell you because I want you to see firsthand how we did this, how we made this transition, and how it applies to you. And that's also my great fear. Because my fear is you might hear this today from me, and you might say, Marcus, this was really, really cool. Congratulations to you. But we're not a pool company. And you see, things here in my business, things are a little bit, go ahead and say it, Different. That's right. What percentage of businesses in the world truly believe they're different? 100%. Nobody ever says we're just like them. If I came to every single person in this room and I said, would you say you have a unique construction process to your boats? You would say, oh, yeah. I mean, the way we do. What we do, and it's true, it is unique, but if we get to the core that ties every business in this room together, other than the fact that you want to learn, and let me just take a time out. They don't do this in the pool industry, by the way. They don't have the vision of great manufacturers, as you'll learn later, I'm now a manufacturer of fiberglass pools. They don't have the same vision that we have in the boating industry because they don't share stuff. And because they don't share stuff, they don't advance. They don't talk. They don't have that all boats rise mentality. You do in this room. And I want to give you huge props for that. And I hope that this will only continue because the, the swimming pool industry struggles with this all the time. And the fact that you're willing to think in this open source fullness mindset versus that scarce mentality is something to say about that. There's a lot to be said about that. But my point to you is, Everything I'm going to tell you today definitively applies because the reason why they buy from you, Hill, is the same reason they bought from me as a pool guy. The reason why somebody chooses your product over somebody else's product and the reason why they give you their money, which is a huge deal, is why. What did they experience? Go ahead and say it. They trust them, don't they? And the one tie that binds everybody in this room, my man, is trust. And that is what I'm going to talk about in the course of these two hours or so that we have together before and after lunch. I want you to see how you can become, how we can become the most trusted voice in our space. And I really mean that. That when anybody thinks of anything in this industry, they think your name, which is very, very possible. Because somebody like me, who's constantly asking questions, who do I go to? And that's going to come out. Because the sad thing is, generally speaking, somebody like me doesn't right now go to the manufacturer. And that's because oftentimes the manufacturers aren't talking about what the buyers so want to know. We're going to look at that. We're going to look at it further. Now, when we were going over the edge, I started to read all these fancy phrases online, right? Because I said the only thing that might help us is the Internet. I saw these phrases like inbound marketing and content marketing and social media and blogging. None of them really register with me, but in my simple pool guy mind, this is what I heard. Marcus, if you just obsess over the questions of your customers, I mean, like, really obsess over them, and you're willing to address them on your website, good, bad, or ugly, you just might save your business. That's simple. So we embrace as a company a philosophy, four simple words, which is this. They ask, you answer. Basically means this. If anybody has ever asked you the question, you feel like, Steve, it's your moral obligation to address it. On the front end, not on the rear, on the front, because you know if you don't address it, they're going to go somewhere else where they can actually get the answer. 
They ask you answer is the willingness to meet them where they are and how they want to buy and how they want to learn, which many of us as businesses, we haven't wanted to adjust the way that we sell. It's the obsession with the way that we think. Now, here's the issue with they ask you answer. Most companies don't embrace it. Most would embrace what we call ostrich marketing. An ostrich, when it has a problem, what does it do? Six to ten in the sand, which is actually a total myth, by the way, but we'll still use it because it's a good example, right? So, it sticks its head in the sand because it thinks, what will happen to the problem? It'll go away. But does it ever go away? So how does this apply to us? Has there ever been a question that you get from customers or potential customers all the time where you said to yourself, you know what? We really can't address that on the website. Think about it. Has there ever been a question where you said, you know what? Let's wait till they're in front of a salesperson. Got any of those? Can you think of one offhand? Quick, anybody go. Come on. Can't talk about money. Good. Anybody else? Come on. Rust. Rust. Can't talk about rust. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, salt, water. Huh? Yeah, can't talk about that. So there's lots of things that we don't want to talk about. The problem is, as you well know, is it possible to become the most trusted voice in your space and be the ostrich at the same time? Is it possible? Is it possible? I know, you know, that if we want to become that voice, we can't be the ostrich. We've got to be something different. We've got to blaze a different type of trail than everybody else has. And so how do we do it? Well, here's what's interesting. When it comes to the way buyers think in the boating industry, there's essentially five things every buyer wants to know. This is B2B and B2C. So every supplier today, trust me, everything I'm telling you, because I've worked with suppliers in this industry and we have absolutely crushed it doing what I'm getting ready to tell you or show you how to do. There's five things that we want to know before we talk to a salesperson or as buyers before we go into the store, the location. Five things we want to know just to gauge so we can say, okay, it's safe to go in there. What are the five subjects? Anybody go, come on, come on. You want to know, or you at least want to have a sense, how much is it? Good. What else? Come on. Okay. So you want to know, is it available, or is it, could it take a long, long time, Joan, to get to me, right? Okay, good. So in other words, I'm going to say that. What are the potential issues, or how could this blow up in my face? What could go wrong if I make this purchase? All right, that's good. Anything else you want to know? Come on. Come on. Okay. Warranty information, in other words, you want to know the general quality, warranty, things like that. Now, with respect to that, though, what's funny is most people don't search for quality. When you search, how do you find things that have high quality? What do you search for specifically? That's right, Jeff, you look for? Reviews. Reviews. Because the way we do it today is we want to know what everybody has said about that particular thing. The other way that we do that, Jeff, is we look for the best. Do you notice nobody's ever searched for the worst 30-foot center console. Nobody's ever searched for that, right? We only search for the best. That's how we are as human beings. So here's the five subjects that literally move this industry in terms of what people want to know before they talk to a salesperson. B2B and B2C. Now here's where it gets interesting. Most of us don't want to talk about the five. We're getting better, though. Some of you have gotten a lot better. Some of you are doing some great things in this room. Now, I just got the list of attendees yesterday. And at least for the manufacturers, I've looked at every single website in this room thoroughly. I spent quite a few hours yesterday. And I've integrated you into this presentation because I love you. <laughs> now, some of you are freaking out, which is good. OK, good. Now. So we're going to talk about how you can address these five things. And not just okay, I'm talking about doing it well. Some of you are talking about them, but you could talk about them even better, and I'm going to show you how to do that. How you can make me as the buyer feel like, my goodness, this company gets me. They understand me. They make me feel so good. They, it's like they were reading my mind. I'm going to show you exactly how to do that right now, but I need everybody's participation because this is the one that this industry is constantly debating about. You know I know. Let's talk about money. All right, so have a little fun. We're here to have fun, right? 
Right, Chris? Yeah, man. Yeah, brother. Always. By the way, looking good, bro. Keep the workouts up. Looking good. All right, so <laughs> when you are on a website and you can't find, <laughs> all right, let me just ask this. By show of hands, how many of you over the last year have at least looked one time online for how much something cost. You've researched how much something costs online. Okay, everybody, anybody living off the grid in this room that I need to be aware of? Which is respectable, by the way, right? It's respectable. So when you're on a website and you can't find anything about cost and price, what is the emotion you experience? What's the emotion? Go ahead, tell me. Go on. Frustration. Somebody said it's the F word of the internet, frustration. So the question is, what gives you the right in that moment to feel frustrated? What gives you the right? Larry, what do you think? What gives you the right to say, ugh? Yeah, I want it now, and I am the what, Larry? Yeah, I'm, the I'm the buyer. I'm the customer. I'm trying to give you my money. Now, in this moment of frustration, does Larry or anybody else in this room, do you say to yourself, oh, that's okay. I'll just stay on this website and keep looking because I'm sure it's here. Yes, sir I'll just look all day. <laughs> you know, we've done the studies. Guess how long somebody will stay on a website if they want to know cost and price and can't find it? Guess how long? 30 seconds. Less than 10 seconds. And it's getting shorter by the day. Think about that for a second. So in this moment of frustration, do you say to yourself, well, that's okay. They're not talking about cost and price. Of course not. They're a value-based business. Yeah, I'm going to call them on the phone instead. Oh, you don't do that either because you stopped that like five years ago. Because instead of calling them on the phone or digging further on their website, you as the buyer... You as the searcher, you keep doing what? You keep searching. And you search until what happens? You find what you were looking for. And generally speaking, whoever gives you what you were looking for, they get what? And if not your business, at least, Cole, they get first contact. And I'm sure we could all agree, if you had a choice, you would always rather be the first company contacted. True? Now, if we analyze this, together. The, psycho the psychology is this. The real reason we get so upset as buyers is because we know that they know the answer. And because we know they know the answer and they're not giving it to us or at least a semblance of it, we now feel like they are doing what? That's right. Deceiving, lying, hiding something from us. And the moment you feel like anybody is hiding anything from you online, what happens? Trust is gone. That being said, we all agree on this because this is how we've changed, correct? We all agree? Now, serious poll, and this is where we just get honest and real with each other, right? We got this chance over the course of three days, so let's get honest and real with each other. By a quick show of hands, and I know many of you do it, which is, which is great, how many of you right now talk a lot about cost and price on your website right now, of your services or products? Raise your hand. Come on, raise your hand. That's actually more than that, all right? So you've got about six or seven. So I want to call it, I'm going to be very liberal and say there's 20% of the room that does it. 20% of the room that does it. Now, the question is why, if we all said this and we feel this way, why don't so many of us actually do it? Now, this is the part of the conversation where some of you start to feel frustrated towards me. You're like, I don't know if I like this guy. You're like, how did he know I didn't like him? It's okay. Because this is why we came, right? We came to be challenged. We didn't come to sing Kumbaya. So let's talk about why we don't talk about it. And in fact, there's three reasons why we don't talk about it. And there's, the reason why I know there's three reasons is because every industry has the same three, Scott. That's what's crazy. All industries have the same three, but we can still talk about them because it's fun. So let's share, shall we? All right, the first reason why we don't talk about cost and price, so many of us, I'm not saying you, but I'm just talking about generally speaking businesses. The first reason why we don't do it, anybody is what? Come on. Competition. I love that one. Competition. Competition. you say that one, Tim? Yeah, competition. Here's the great one about that one, Tim, right? If I came to you or anybody else in this in this room that's been in the game for any period of time, and I said, do you have a very good sense as to what your competitors charge? What would you say? Oh, yeah, we ain't dumb. We've done our market research. And so here's the big secret. If you know what they charge, it therefore means what? 
they know what you charge. Feels like, daggone, I never thought about that. <laughs> so this is the big secret, non-secret. Everybody acts like nobody knows what everybody's charging, when in reality, everybody has actually pretty good sense as to what everybody's charging. And besides that, when was the last time your competitors paid your bills? Yet we allow them to dictate our decisions. Pretty crazy, isn't it? Pretty crazy. Now, the second reason why we don't like to talk about cost and price is, come on, share, share. Fear of what? That if we're more expensive, we might, go ahead and say it. We might lose the customer. What's your name, by the way? Uh, Didi. Didi. Okay, good. You thought about that, Didi. Sure. Okay, good, 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 good. So, so, so we might lose the customer, right? What's funny is we don't have them yet, Didi, right? Yet notwithstanding, we're afraid that if I show them and it's more expensive, we might lose them. What's interesting, what we all just agreed a few minutes ago, we said the thing that actually scares us away when we're in that research process is when the business, that's right, when they don't talk about the thing. Case in point, now I'm going to give you an example. You're going to say, Marcus, it's a silly example because it's not the same thing. I promise it is because it's just psychology. So let's, let's look at this. Let's say we want to go to a new restaurant tonight. Okay, you're going to take a loved one. You want it to be a great experience, right? So when you go to that restaurant tonight, before you go, you're going to do two things, two things before you go to ensure that it's a great experience, not including make a reservation. What are the two things you're going to do before you go to that restaurant tonight to make sure it's going to be a great experience? Anybody go, come on. Check you're going to check reviews and look at the menu. Good. Now, that was really fast. We're all humans. We've all picked up on the same patterns. Fascinating, right? So here's where it gets interesting. If you go to the menu and there is no pricing, are you still going to go? Now, some of you are saying, before you answer, is this a business expense or not? <laughs> All right, that's fair. That's very, very fair. Very, very fair. This is what we found. He's like, how did he know I was thinking that? I know, man. So this is what we found, that in that moment, 80% of all people don't go. And it's not because, George, they can't afford it. What's the reason why they don't go? It's the unknown. Because the moment they left it blank, they planted a seed of doubt. And when seeds of doubt exist, what happens? Inertia occurs and people stop moving. So same example, real quick. It's just, again, psychology. We've got to beat it in. Some of you have been at that same restaurant before. You wanted to order the lobster. But next to the lobster, you saw a phrase, Brent, which was market price. And in that moment, sir, you had a debate, didn't you? You said, do I ask the server how much it is or not? Because the problem is, Brent, if you ask the server how much it is and then you don't buy it, what happens? You look cheap. And Brent, you are cheap, sir. You are. You are, right? He says, look at my shoes. Look at my shoes. And now he's like, look at these bad boys. Brent is not cheap. I want some of them loafers. Now, you say, Marcus, it's different. Psychology, same thing. So that's the second fear. That's the second reason why we say it. Now, the third reason why we don't like to talk about cost and price is because we say, well, every job or every boat or every customer is different. Now, the funny one about that is that's actually the easiest to answer. If I came to you, and I said, Jeff, can you help me understand what would drive the cost of your services or products up? Could you explain that, yes or no? Yes. If I came to you and I said, can you help me understand the factors that would drive it down? Could you explain that, yes or no? Yes. If I came to you, Jeff, and I said, you gave me a quote for that service or product. Appreciate the quote. I also got some quotes from your competitors. Here's what's fascinating. Some of you are really expensive. Some of you are really cheap. And then I'm seeing everything in between. Why is there such a delta? Can you help me understand what drives these deltas within the boating industry? Could you help me understand that? Yes. And of course, how many times have you had to explain that over the years? If we continue to answer the same questions over and over again, what does it mean? It means we are not teaching like we can. Because do you need the practice, John? Do you want to have that same question that you've heard 5,000 times just so you could Give that same answer you've given 5,000 times. How many times have you gotten a question on the showroom floor and you literally rolled your eyes in the back of your head saying, oh my goodness, what's a center console again? Now, 
before we move on, how much does a fiberglass pool cost? Does anybody know? Between thirty and sixty thousand. Certainly, my man, it certainly could could have cost a hundred thousand. Could have cost five hundred thousand. Yeah, we can get you there. I promise. We'll get you there. Yes, yes. So the answer to how much does the fiberglass pool cost is the same thing it is for everybody in this room, which is it depends. And when we embrace this philosophy of they ask you answer, I said, Dag on it. This is the number one question everybody asks within the first five minutes. Marcus, I'm not going to hold you to it now, brother, but just give me a feel. What are we looking at here? Just give me a range. I won't hold you. And so I said, I am tired of answering this question. Why don't I do a better job? And so we talked about it openly on the website. And we said, you know what? Buying a fiberglass pool, it's a lot like buying a car. There's a lot of options. There's a lot of accessories because, you know, everybody's bought a car. They understand how it works. So we talked about the factors that would drive it up. We talked about the factors that would keep it down. We talked about different packages. We talked about how some people want a very basic pool and how it would be in this range and how some people want a very high-end pool and it's going to be in this range. We said, ultimately, the answer to your question is... It depends. But because we were willing to explain why it depends, something very interesting happened next. Two things. The consumer, the buyer, was changed fundamentally. That conversation at first, it, used to be, it was like so different than it was before that because literally they were saying to me on the phone, Marcus, I just want to thank you because finally somebody was willing to help me understand this thing. Which I so relate to because when I was looking for my first large boat, I had no concept of these things. I just didn't know. But it didn't seem like many wanted to talk to me and help me understand. Now, the cool thing is this is shifting within this industry. But because of that, the buyer conversation started to change. From a search perspective, within 48 hours of writing that article and posting it on our website, if you went online and you search average cost fiberglass pool, how much does a fiberglass pool cost? How much does it cost to install a pool? We're the first one you saw on the left side of the page. I'm not talking about the ads. I'm talking about, of course, organic search. You're familiar with that, right? The ones that we actually click on. Now, that's just visitors. We're not here for visitors. We're here for revenue. So let's talk about marketing revenue because this is where it matters. Stay with me for just a second. I promise this will make sense. Here's a list of the number one phrases over the next few years that generated the most traffic to our website. So stay with me. If you look up here, we had 13,000 people go to Google. They typed in fiberglass pool prices. And of those 13,000, 30 of them filled out a form and said, I want to get a quote from you. So the numbers that you see on the right side of the page, these are sales appointments that came from people that originally searched that phrase. Now, what's the red arrow indicate? The red arrow indicates anyone that searched the phrase and first landed on that article that was on our website, how much does a fiberglass pool cost? And so the total number of sales appointments from people that originally landed on that article, in other words, they found out about us from that page of our website, is over 200 plus sales appointments. So here's the important question. If that article is never written, if we never openly talk about it on the website, how many of those sales appointments ever occur? Anybody? Come on. Zero to almost none. Why? Why, Randy? Why? Nobody knows, man, right? Nobody knows. They never showed up. But they did. And many of them did read more. And many of them did fill out a form. And many of them did say, I want to get a quote. And many of them did actually buy. And of course, we know the names of each one of the ones that bought. Therefore, we know the value of their pools. Therefore, I can add up all the values of all those pools and place it on top of one little article that took me 45 minutes to write at my kitchen table one night. And I can tell you without equivocation that that one single article has generated over $5 million in sales since the day it was written. Now, for some of you, that's not a lot, but for a pool guy, that will change a business forever. That single article saved the jobs of those 16 employees. Saved my business. And oh, by the way, did we ever say how much a fiberglass pool cost? Yes or no? Well, that's up for debate. That's up for debate. <laughs> but this much I do know. The results speak for themselves. You see, so often... We feel like we've got to just put the price. Now, some of you are doing a great job with this. Here's what's interesting about this. I'm not asking you today in this moment for every single person to do what some of you are doing. But I will say this. When we've done this all over the world with companies and organizations all over the world at this point, experimented with this conversation, what's fascinating is the more companies talk about cost and price, the more specific they become over time. Does anybody have a guess as to why? Why that is? 
Come on. Why do you think that is? Well, no, see, Chris, what happens is, you, I mean, you could stay vague as you want for the, from now until the end of time, at least on your website. But people, they notice certain trends. Companies notice trends, and then they start becoming more specific, not less, with what they've said. Why is that? More certainty of what, Joe? Of success. Of success. Here's what happens. They start closing more deals. And the sales calls become much better. So, as to how specific you are, this is your call. But we do know this, that today's buyer will not tolerate ignorance. They want to at least have a feel for things. And for me, when I got into this game, I had no idea why one boat was 700000 another boat was 70000 And what's crazy is nobody would explain it to me. I mean, where did I have to go to find out that information? Where did I go? The whole truth? Because that's apparently the Bible of the industry right now. Now, what's so great is some of you get it. So, for example, now, by the way, I did want to mention this. I know almost everybody in here has gone to this website, cdealercost.com. There are no secrets in this industry. Now, this might not be incredibly accurate, but cdealercost.com pretty much tells the world what some of the pricing is within this industry on almost all of the major brands. Hopefully, you've seen this. So if I wanted to buy a Grady, I could go and just get a sense at least for what the invoice in the MSRP is. I could get a sense for what some of the different options are. I can get these senses as a buyer today. That's why there really are no secrets left anymore. So here's what's cool. You got people like Mastercraft. Raise your hand, raise your hand, Mastercraft. Okay. What's your name, buddy? Terry. Terry. So Terry, this is why I love what you did, my man. Is it okay if I highlight some of you for doing good things? So Terry, I love the fact that I went to your homepage and immediately you said, you know what, I'm not embarrassed. I'm not shy. I know you are my buyer, Marcus, and so let's have a conversation right now because you want to know. And you allowed me to go in here and I immediately started learning about this particular model, and it was a great experience for me as a user. Thank you for that. It was a really, really great experience when I went there. I was so impressed. It was like, bam, yeah, he gets it. They get it. Now, Chris Craft, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Chris Craft, you're doing some great things. So impressed that you were willing to broach this subject, and you started to get the even fuller vision. It's Steve. So, Steve, here's the, here's the issue that I have, and this is going to keep coming up. One of the things that you did a good job here of on this page, you notice you've got this paint versus gel coat. So there's this whole set of questions that I have as I'm building out my, my quote, right? So I've got all these questions in my mind. You actually answered some of them, but there's so many more that I have. So the fact that you've done this, huge, beautiful, user-friendly. I was getting I was loving it. The fact that you started to teach me, huge win but there's so many other questions I want you to know that I had. Does that make sense to you, Steve? Make sense? We keep going with that. Pursuit. Man, golly, Pursuit, you're doing so many good things. Tommy, Chain, I just love what you're doing. Now, once again, I was able to build it out, and this is actually like, what, for me, I, some, I debate all the time, as you're going to see shortly, between do I want to walk around again or do I want a center console? And so then I've got a set of center consoles that I'm looking at, and I've got a set of walk arounds that I'm looking at, and really in my mind, I'm like, so where's this boat going to be? Because wherever the boat is, that for me is mainly going to dictate the type of boat that I buy. Of course, I didn't know that when I started this process. I've had to learn that as I went. But the beauty behind this is they allowed me to build it out so well. They had this send, to, um, send build, which is the, it's like build your boat. So I just love this. Many of you have the build your boat. Some of you talk more about this than others, but they've got all the options. But once again, pursuit, same deal. Who's pursuit, by the way? Where's pursuit? Yeah. So, you know, Tom, Tom, I'll, all I wanted a few times, I just wanted to know, understand more about what those options meant. Because, as I'm going to show later, there's probably at least 40, to, even me, like being an actual kind of boater, right? Only been in the game for five years, probably 40% of the options, I still don't understand whether I want them or not. So, I, I oh, you want them, brother. You want them. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You want them. You want them. You want them. Good, 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 good. So here's what's funny. What's funny is 
As soon as somebody drops this, and this didn't exist a few years ago. This has been what we're showing right now, I'm almost guaranteeing, is the ones that are doing this, and there's others in this room that are doing it as well, You've all done this within the last few years because you're recognizing the change. Good for you, but there's so much more because here's the problem. If I see that a pursuit is, let's say this one's 325, I didn't even add any options there, but let's say it's 400,000. And then somebody else with the 35 foot walk around is going to be 100,000 more, 100,000 less, which is going to be the case. The question still is right now, I can't fully understand it in my head. I can't, in other words, I couldn't explain it to my wife. Yeah, it's $100,000 more, but let me definitively explain to you why. Does it make sense, Tom, what I'm saying? You give me a look like, Marcus, I don't believe you. I just want you to know that before I ever came here, I looked at your boats for at least three to four hours because I'm so interested in the pursuit. I love your 360 videos. I've looked at every single model and toured it like three or four times. I mean, literally, this is my mind as a buyer. Am I making any sense? So, another one that I went to was Rabalo. Now, Rabalo's not in this room, but here's what's interesting about Rabalo. Rabalo was one of the first ones that really started to talk about price. I can literally remember, it was a year and a half ago, we were sitting around, I was sitting around with my family, um, my brother-in-law, it was like two of my brother-in-laws. And we were talking about boats. We are at the river house. I'm like, Marcus, what boat do you want to buy? I'm like, well, I think I might want to get like a 30 to 35 foot um, um, walk around. I'm not sure what. I said, do you all want to build one together right now? And they're like, oh, yeah. Let's see how much this bad boy is going to cost, right? And so literally around the kitchen table with my brother-in-laws, we chose the options together. We built it out. And they're all like, dude, you're going to spend that much? I'm like, I know, it's crazy, right? But at least we had that experience together. And at least I knew. So this is where the industry's headed. The choice is, do we meet the consumer where they are or not? Any questions about cost and price? Now's the time to ask. Help me understand what drives it up. Help me understand what keeps it down especially for you that are more expensive, you can turn it into a buying advantage for you. You just got to help me see the vision. Now, let's look at negatives for a second. All right. So let's be hypothetical. Let's say that I'm just going to go back to the pool example. All right. So let's say your name, sir, was Peter. Peter. Let's say you want to get a fiberglass pool, right? So you meet with Marcus back in the day when I was still a pool guy. Obviously, I still own the company, but I, I don't sell them anymore, right? So you think you want to get a fiberglass pool, but to keep me honest, you meet with John, who sells concrete pools. And as soon as you meet with John, who sells concrete pools, what's he going to say about Marcus's fiberglass pools? They have problems. They have problems. In fact, they suck. Let's be honest. I mean, that's what John's going to say, right? I mean, you don't want to get that fiberglass pool, man. They're not, like, wide enough. They're not long enough. You can't customize them. They're not deep enough. I mean, it's not even a real pool, bro. It's like a bathtub in your yard. Why would you do that? <laughs> I'm telling you, here at John's Concrete Pools, we have none of problems with them things, and I don't want you to have those problems in your backyard for years to come. Now, a minute ago, he really liked me. Now, he's worried specifically about what? That's right. The problems with fiberglass pools. And if he's worried about the problems with fiberglass pools, what's he going to search? Let's not, let's not make him more science than what it is. He's going to research problems with fiberglass pools. How many times over the years do you think somebody had asked me, Marcus, be honest, what are the problems with fiberglass pool? How many times? Thousands of times. Yet, notwithstanding how many swimming pool companies had addressed that simple question on their website? None. None. Why? Why not? Why not? Fear of losing the sale. Fear of losing the sale, right? Which, again, Amy, or Anne, excuse me, what happens is we think that hiding the elephant and putting it in the corner is going to be more effective than just coming to the front door with the elephant and saying, this is our elephant. We love our elephant. And so we openly talked about the issues with fiberglass pools. We said fiberglass pools aren't for everybody. They don't get wider than 16 feet. They don't get longer than 40 feet. They don't get deeper than 8 feet. You can't customize them any way you want. But if you're looking for a low-maintenance pool that will last you a lifetime, well, then it might be a great choice for you. But because we were willing to say that, what happened next? You see, I can tell you all these things, and the beauty behind the numbers is the numbers don't lie. 
Numbers are the numbers. Here's a list of the number one phrases that generated the most sales appointments, quotes, to our company over the next couple years. The number one that generated the most sales appointments was our company name with 56, but I don't count that one because they were looking for us. The rest of the people you see on the screen were folks that didn't know who they wanted to engage. They just knew they had a general question. And so the number one phrase that gener generated the most sales appointments over the next two years was fiberglass pools problems. How is it possible that talking about the negatives the perceived negatives could, in this case, generate over a half a million dollars in revenue. Anybody, tell me, how is it possible? Come on. Because they trust you and because, Didi, you're getting in front of it, right? You're getting in front of it. And the best way in life to resolve concerns is to do what? Get in front of them. Address it before it becomes a concern. That's why if you run for office, you've got to do what? you got to tell people you smoke dope, right? That's how it works. That's how it works, right? Okay, so I want you to think about all the negative questions you've gotten over the years. In other words, somebody came to you and they said, I heard such and such about this type of boat. Is that true? Or I heard if I chose this, then it has these drawbacks. So the question is, are you going to allow them to learn that answer from somebody else, or are you going to control the conversation? So, for example... Let's say I went online and I searched for the pros, um, center console boats, pros and cons. This is a perfect example of it. Now, look who runs the industry. We got BoatTrader.com. We got, I, oh, we got iFish.net. We've got BoatMax.com. We've got the Hall Truth, of course, are there. BD Outdoors, AUSFish.com, and Texas Fishing Forum. What do you not see? On that page, and this is what's dictating the world's knowledge of center console boats, pros and cons, which is a very prolific search, by the way. You don't see any manufacturers. We're letting third party sites teach our customers. I want to learn from you. Now you say, I don't know if you want to learn. Yes, I do. But you can't be biased. You've got to be just real. You have to be honest. Everybody wants that. Right? Bertram, man, y'all make an amazing boat. I've looked at your boats. But, of course, I debate all the time. I say, they just have the inboard motors. They don't have the outboard motors. Is that really something that I want to do? Now, Peter, you're smiling. Because I know I'm not the first person that's ever brought this up, am I? Never heard it before. Never heard it before. Yeah, yeah, you're good. You're good. You're good. I'm blind, right? So, so the question is, do I learn it from somebody else? Do I hear it from you? What could you do to alleviate that? Because people aren't dumb. Even the uninformed will become the informed. This is what I know. Let's look at another one. I like you, Peter, by the way, and I really love your boats, man. And I loved reading about the history of Bertram as well. <laughs> Comparisons. A minute ago, my man, maybe he liked fiberglass pools. But let's say he likes fiberglass and concrete pools. In other words, he can't decide between the two. If he likes fiberglass and concrete pools, what's he going to search next? Come on, what's he going to search? Price. Yeah, compare what? Price. Compare concrete and fiberglass pools. Because that's what's on his mind. I want to know which is better, concrete or fiberglass pools, which is better. So this is how the buyer searches. They search exactly what they're thinking in their head. Yet notwithstanding, when we started this process of they ask you answer, how many pool dealers had addressed that question on their website? Zero. Once again, what were they afraid of? Fiberglass pool guy was saying this. Our biggest competitor is concrete pools. So this is what we're going to do. We won't even talk about them on our website. And if we don't talk about them, well, then nobody will know they exist. <laughs> like, really, RVs aren't real. There are no such thing as an RV. This is what we do, though. So we openly compared them. Now, by the way, did we say fiberglass was better than concrete, yes or no? No. Why did we not say it? That's right, my man. He said, you let them make their own decision. And besides that, it would have not been true. Because there are times when concrete is a better option. 
Now, if you're going to produce an article or a video, and see, this is, the, this is the issue every business has, and daggone in the boating industry, good grief, we love our products, which I get. But if you want to come across as the trusted voice, you've got to be willing to show both sides of the coin. And so that would sound something like this. Let's say that you're going to do a video right now of um, walk-arounds versus center consoles. And let's say you just do center consoles. Okay? I'm just choose regulator for a second. Okay? Now, this is going to drive Joan crazy, right? She's going to be like, oh, Marcus, you're killing me here. So she's going to do that video. She might say this. You know, every year here at Regulator, we get asked, all right, I'm debating between a walk-around and a center console. So tell me, why should I choose a center console? Well, the truth is, you need to understand a few things. Here at Regulator, we only do center console boats. That's what we love. But we recognize center console isn't always the best option for everyone. There may be times when a walk around is a better option. So what this video is going to do, it's going to explain to you thoroughly the pros and the cons of both types of designs. And then by the end, you'll hopefully be able to decide which is the best choice for you. Now, Joan, people love you anyway, but if you said that, they would love you even more. But then you have to show the other side of the coin, don't you? And most of us don't want to admit that. Am I making sense? Think about all the comparison-based questions you've gotten over the years. Somebody, give me an example of a comparison-based, hey, if you were me, which would you choose question that you've heard over the years? Come on. Come on. What's that? Stocks are fine. Well, I guess. Yes, yes, yeah. In this industry, come on. What's a question? Alan. Inboard versus outboard. Heard it a million times, right? Heard it a million times. Come on, somebody else. Come on. Generator, no generator. Generator, no generator. Which route should I go? I've absolutely thought about that myself. That's one of the questions I'm asking, and that's one of the things I'm looking for now, right? Anybody else, especially with all the winter fishing that we do? Wood or no wood? What's the best way to go? I've asked myself that question, understanding, like, wood, no wood, or what's the... You clearly should go wood. Clearly should go wood. Yeah, Tim. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 thank you, thank you. So here's the choices that we have. I can tell you this, because we were willing to address that question, concrete versus fiberglass, today if you go online and you compare any type of in-ground pool versus another in-ground pool, we're the first ones you're going to see. We own literally that entire conversation. Even if somebody is searching, for example, concrete versus vinyl pools, we don't sell those pools. <laughs> But if you search it, who are you going to learn the answer from? Why? Why do I want to be a part of that conversation? That's right, because I might be able to inject myself into the process. And even if I can't inject myself into the process, at least I can give them some value. So maybe they'll refer me to a friend. Maybe they'll link it out to somebody else. Who knows what will happen? But that's what it means to give, to be a true educator, to see the big picture. Now, you're, some of you are doing this very well. I'm not sure if my French is any good. Group Benito, are you here? Raise your hand. Now, you guys, man, this is great. I love the fact that you understood. I mean, they have this tool that allowed me to go on there and say, okay, I'm looking at this trawler, this trawler, this trawler, and I want to compare the three, and I could interchange it. That was such, George, that was such a great user experience for me. Really, really helpful. I hope you only continue to drive that because this is something that in almost every line that I've looked at, I've compared. You know, I'm always either looking at the 30 or the 35 footer or it's this or it's that. I'm constantly doing that, doing a great job with that. Now, in conjunction with this, Mag Bay, are you here? Okay, Mag Bay. My man, what was the name again? Barrett. Barrett. So, I, you know, you're doing so many things right. And I really loved your site. I can tell you've been like, I can tell you put a lot of money into the site over the last couple of years, haven't you? Like you've been investing time and money into it. Now, here's the thing. You're semi-catching the vision here, and this applies to everybody in this room. So please, please pay attention right here. So you're looking at, here's all the options that you're telling me I could get, and this is just like a snippet from the page, right? And so some of the cool things that you're doing is on each one of these, you're saying, not everyone, but you're saying you can view it. But let me give you the quick sense of what I was talking about. And this applies to some, some of you that I was talking about earlier time and applied to that conversation I was making with you. Okay? So this is me as a, this is like really what goes through my mind. I'm just going to read this out. 
Hall color. Gel coat with option for second color under chine. I don't know what chine means. I don't know what that means. Bootstripe, two inch gel coat stripe, one inch above waterline. I do know what that means. Bottom paint, Interlux, Tri Interlux Trilux 33 standard. Is that good or bad? I want to know. I don't really understand at all what it means, but I do know I would love to know right now. XL hardtop, extended top with 35% more coverage. That sounds great, but just if I have 35% more, what does it mean? Does it mean that I can maybe fit another person on the top? Does it mean maybe I can have more room to cast or something like for Kobe? I don't like really know what that means right now. 316 stainless steel legs with mere polished welds. I honestly have no idea what that means. Now, dude, you are doing great on your site. But you got to remember, I am the ignorant consumer. Some of this stuff I definitely have learned. Much of this I still don't know. And everybody in this room, there is a whole bunch of sets on your sites right now that I want to understand. I just don't. Am I making sense? Say yes if you're with me. Okay, cool. Cool. Is this helpful? Okay, good. Good. Now, let's continue to look at this, reviews and best. So we've looked at three of the big five. We've looked at cost and how there's this dramatic shift with people want to understand cost and price and how we need to better at least help them understand why the costs go up or what makes it cheap. We've talked about comparisons. We've talked about the negatives. And now let's combine these last two reviews and best. Before I do that, let me tell you a story. I was once, um, well, have you ever been asked before by somebody that was shopping with you? They said, we like you. We do. We think we want to do business with you guys. We want to get this from you. But if we don't get it from you, is there anybody else that you might recommend? Anybody ever heard that question? You just love that question, don't you? So when you get asked that question, I'm not saying you, but generally, how do most companies answer that question? Come on. Well, I mean, there's nobody quite like, I mean, I have no idea who to tell you. I mean, you know, geez. I mean, it's just escaping me. Why would you consider that anyway? I mean, and of course, the person asked the question, they're thinking, oh, come on, just be honest. You know, one night I was in Richmond, Virginia. This is when I was still a pool guy like seven years ago. And somebody said to me, Marcus, it's after a two and a half hour appointment, right? Been there two and a half hours, gave him the quote, big hoorah. They said, Marcus, we like you. We do. We think we want to get this pool from you. But if we don't get this pool from you, is there anybody else you might recommend? And I thought, I hate this question because I didn't sell the pool that night. But I did have a long drive home, and I thought to myself, well, they asked the question, which means what? That's right. I got to answer it. Remember, it's they ask, you answer. So I went home that night, and I wrote this article right here. And I will tell you, when I did this, my two business partners freaked out a little bit. Who are the best pool builders in Richmond, Virginia? Review slash ratings. And I came up with a list of five of the best pool builders in Richmond, Virginia. Now, first question for you. Am I on that list of five, yes or no? Yeah, better be. My man says, better be. Does <laughs> anybody say no? You say no, Dee Dee. Oh, Dee Dee, you're on such a roll. Don't stop, girl. <laughs> you might not have known your name, but you know this stuff now. Okay, so, so Dee Dee, you say no. Why do you say no? Yeah. And then you're just give them five so here's the thing. If they're reading this, where are they? They're on my site. I don't need to. They're looking around my house. Right, Tommy? So they're here. I'm already winning. But let's go even further. Let's be hypothetical. Let's say that you just moved to Richmond, Virginia. You want to get a pool. You don't know who you want to get the pool from. Or you want to get a boat. Same thing. It's all the same. And so... You search online, best pool builders, Richmond, Virginia. And of course, this is the first thing that you see. It's the first thing that pops up because lo and behold, they're the only one that bothered to answer the question. And you start to read the first two paragraphs. Now, I'm going to read the first two paragraphs to you. I want you to tell me your impression of this company after the first two paragraphs. You ready? Here we go. Each year, we at River Pools and Spas meet with well over 100 households in the Central Virginia, Richmond area with respect to their in-ground swimming pool installation. 
And because so many folks know our thoughts and feelings from this website on all things pool construction, they often ask us, who are some of the other builders and competitors we have in the area? Never once to shy away from being blatantly honest with respect to the competition, here's a list of some of the companies that have a solid in-ground pool building history in the Richmond area. What's your impression of this company right now? Trust okay, trust them, honest. Do you feel like they're an expert, yes or no? But did they say they're an expert? But you feel it, why? Why do you feel it? Being honest, right, Ned? So what is the result of this? Well, of course, if you go online and you search best pool builders, Richmond, Virginia, or best boat dealers, or best boat, it's all the same. This is the first one that you see, but that's not the cool part. Let's say you don't even know who River Pools is, okay? And you went online, and you search for reviews, play more pools, Richmond, Virginia. This happens to be our biggest competitor in Richmond, Virginia. Once you get past the sponsored search that nobody's going to click on anyway, the first one you're going to see, the first one you're going to read, the first one you're going to click is, and that's why today, if you're researching any of my competitors, more often than not, you're going to learn about them where? On my website. I had a lady come to me a couple years ago. She said, Marcus, it's a true story. I was this close to buying a pool from Playmore Pools. But before I bought that pool from them and signed that contract, I decided to go online and research their company. And as I was researching their company, I stumbled across this article that you guys had written. And I said, my goodness, these guys are so honest, I should probably call them too. And of course, you know what happened, don't you? Because otherwise, I wouldn't be telling you the story, right? <laughs> that article generated $150,000 in sales that year. And some of you might be saying, yeah, but aren't you afraid you've now introduced them to your competition? Y'all, if somebody wants to know who your competitors are, roughly how long will it take them to figure it out? Seconds. And this is why you know and I know that consumer ignorance is no longer a viable sales and marketing strategy. Even the uninformed will become the informed, especially if they're spending $50,000, $100,000, a million dollars, $5 million on a boat. The amount of people in this space that are searching this right now is prolific. I'm hoping that as you hear me today, the worst case scenario is that you're thinking, my goodness, there's so much I got to help my dealers do. There's so much they could be doing more to induce more trust. This isn't just about the manufacturers. This isn't just about suppliers. And the cool thing is, all you suppliers, every rule applies. It's the same thing. So don't put yourself in a different box. It is the exact same. And this is prolific in every industry. This is what people are doing. And because we were willing to do this and have this philosophy, this is where we started in 2009 after the crash, getting less than 1,000 visitors a month. Now, this is the traffic to our website. The green represents, of course, organic traffic. The reason why it's wavy, it's the same reason why it's wavy on your site, because we're seasonal businesses, aren't we? Last year, we hit over 600,000 visitors a month. Today, we're the most trafficked swimming pool website in the entire world. And it all happened because we said, we are going to be the Wikipedia of swimming pools. If anybody has a question, good, bad, or ugly, we're going to address it. This is our religion, this is who we are, and we're never going to stop. And it stopped, in this case, the hemorrhaging that was 2009. And we started to build momentum. And then, of course, two years ago, because of all that momentum and the revenue that we had generated, I was getting all these leads from all over the country and I couldn't do anything with them because I was just a little pool installer in Virginia. And so that's when I built a manufacturing facility. And today, of course, we're manufacturing fiberglass swim pool shells and we're building dealers all over the country. And based on the current model, we'll do over 200 pools this year manufactured, which is unheard of for manufacturers in our space at that short period of time. And based on the model, it looks like we'll be the largest manufacturer of fiberglass pools in the US within seven to 10 years. And we don't have any regional sales reps. All because, as you know, just like I do, if one homeowner, if one consumer demands a product, that's more effective than 50 visits from a regional sales rep. Now, 
Any questions about they ask you answering you? Any questions? Good? Jeff? Good? Larry? Got it? Cool? Now, let's talk about what's next, because what's next is really, really interesting. So we've had this evolution that's occurred, and I call it the me revolution, because many of us are becoming very, very obsessed with how we do it. And so let me give you an example of what I mean by this me shift. So over the past two years, people searching online with the phrase for me has exploded by 130%. So what do we mean by that? Can you think of a phrase that you've gone online and searched that included for me? Come on. Think like a buyer for a minute. Think like a consumer for a minute. What causes you to win in this business is thinking like a consumer, a buyer. So let me give you an example of things that you're searching, just like me, all the time. This is really common stuff. For example, what car is right for me? Prolific search. What diet is best for me? What is the best washer dryer unit for me? Prolific searches. Used to be that we would just say, what is the best car? What is the best diet? What is the best washer dryer unit? Now, we feel like it should be personalized for us. So how does this relate to the boating industry? Anybody, come on. How does this relate to us? Come on. Come on, in the back, go ahead. I'm sorry, Tom? Best boat for me, right? And so if you wanted to have somebody have, to, if you wanted to answer that question, let's go even beyond an article, for, for example. What could you create to help me have an amazing self-selective experience of choosing the right boat for me on your site? What could you do? So, right, so we could create a series of questions, right? And so the series of questions would essentially be almost like if-thens that would lead you to a certain point where at the end of it, Joan, you might, the person says, you might ask the question, so you're looking mainly for bay fishing or are you looking for all sort of fishing? Do you have a family or do you, not, do you not have a family? Do you want to fish hardcore or do you want to do a lot of just other types of cruising activities? All these questions would go into it. And this is the type of app that you could build very, very easily on your website to the point where at the end, you can tell them the exact model, the exact size. But here's the cool thing, Joan. It didn't come from the salesperson. Who did it come from? The person that was asking the question because they are the ones that want to feel like they dictated the sales process. This is something that's the next place. You've all done, some of you have just done this amazing job of putting these cost elements on the site. This is what's next for you. Right now, we're building out the same thing on my site that allows you to go to river pools and decide, Chris, okay. I want a freeform pool or I want a straight edge pool. I want it to be deep or I want it to be shallow. But here's the thing. Every one of the questions, it doesn't just ask you the question. It also explains the thought process, the pros and the cons behind deep versus shallow, curvy versus long. We don't just accept that you know. We're going to teach you throughout that process. Make sense? And because of this, if you can do this, they're going to call you up after this and they're going to say, I already know. Your, your little tool already told me. I know it's the exact one I want. That's a powerful thing. Let's look at another one. Should I? Should I? Yeah. Oh, yes, Tom, go ahead. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. I mean, I have, as a manufacturer, I have a fear. So you're the customer. Yeah. So if I want to pose these questions, we're conditioned mentally because we're all being told you're only going to be there for X amount of seconds, maybe a minute, maybe a minute and a half, three minutes max if you're really interested. So when I start taking you down this list of questions, yeah. my marketing department starts, you know, getting jitters because they're like, hey, the guy's going to, he's going to see that list of questions and he's going. So Tom, this is a great question. The idea, and we have the analytics behind this, buyers, once they get it all serious, they will spend dramatically more time than one, two, three minutes. We have all bought into this idea that everything should be short and it's fundamentally false. Let me give you one example of this. The average number one ranked page in Google, like number one that you see, is over a thousand words. The average number one ranked video on YouTube that you search for is longer than 10 minutes. 
Yet everybody's telling you, create 90 second videos. Fundamentally false, and by the way, after lunch, we're gonna talk a ton about video. You're gonna love it, I promise. Now, there's all these false measurements that are based on what works on social media, not what works for the person that's getting ready to spend $400,000. Because here's the thing, if I just started thinking about a boat or a swimming pool or anything like that last night, do you think I want to spend necessarily a ton of time yet? No. Not yet, but if I'm going to a dealership tomorrow and I could write a check for $200,000, am I willing to spend more than five minutes of my time? You darn straight I am. I'm willing to spend way more time than that. Great question, Tom. Good thoughts. Should I? Now, should I is fascinating as well. And I want to show you because this really shows us where we are as buyers today. This is pretty nuts. I'm just going to show it to you because this is what we're searching. These are the number one should I searches in the world right now. You want to see them? Say yes. Yeah, good. Now you want to see them. Of course you do. Number one, what should I order for lunch? Because apparently you don't know, right? Number two, should I get my hair cut? Some of you should not. Number three, and this three is the saddest one, should I text him? Look, this is what your daughters and granddaughters, look, the answer is no. If you have to ask a computer, no. And then finally, finally, what? should I do with my life? People buy a boat, right? You can't buy happiness, but you can buy a boat, which is pretty much the same thing. Yes. So this personalization that we're seeing, remember, it's fun, but we got to bring it back, right? So think about all the should I's and listen for this now. As you now have people come into your showroom, or as you're talking to your vendor partners and they are asking you these should I questions, make sure you're the first to address it and give them the ability to self-select. This self-selection is a trend that's not going to stop. Now, Tom, this one's specific to your last question there. And this is the last thing we're gonna talk about before lunch, because we're gonna stop at 11.45, okay? And this one is significant and it's major. All right, and I think you're going to have fun with this. Now, on average, how many pages of your website do you think a potential customer is willing to read before they buy, on average? Does anybody know? 15. 15. Good guess, my man. Yeah. May else have one? Five, did he, five did he said? Okay, five. Yeah. All of them. All of them? Right? Okay, I like that. The, the vast majority. The vast majority. Yeah. Yeah, if they're buying a quarter million dollar boat, they just might be ready. Yeah, Matthew, I love it. So let me tell you about a story that changed my life because we've all been taught that people are too busy, right, Matthew? That they have the attention of a goldfish, which is, whoever made that study up? They're the dumbest, like, this is the dumbest study ever. People are not goldfish, I promise, right? And so this number 30 changed my life. It was 2013, and I was looking not at theories. I was looking at the numbers, the web analytics, so every number that I've given you today, you notice I keep giving you numbers. It's, they're real because we have the analytics to measure it. And so I was looking at two groups of people on my website in 2013. Both of them had filled out a form and said, I want to get a quote from you. One of them bought. One of them did not buy. So I said, what is the difference between the ones that did versus did not buy? And this is what we found. The number 30 kept jumping out underneath the group that had bought. What do you think that number 30 represented? Pages viewed. This is what we found. If somebody read 30 or more pages of our website before the initial sales appointment, they would buy 80% of the time. If they didn't read that many pages, the closing rates, can anybody guess? 25% which happens to be industry average in the pool industry. Closing rate of 25% if you go into the home. So what was happening over the course of those 30 pages that made them say, you're my company? What happened? Trust. They are being educated, self-selecting, down the funnel, on their own, like we've been talking about this morning. So if you knew that all you had to do was get someone to read, I'm just being hypothetical, 30 pages of your website, what would you do differently? 
<laughs> Put some pretty girls on there, Chris. Yeah, Chris, Chris, Chris. Yeah, always thinking about the same thing, my man. Yeah, yeah. I gotta look good, and they gotta look good too, right, Chris? So, so you could do that. You could do that. But they might come into the showroom and say, "We're the girls," right? Right? So, here's the problem. Too often, we just throw up content to the site and we hope that it works. And we don't intentionally integrate it into the sales process. And so when I realized the power of 30, we completely changed the way that we sold. I mean, completely changed the way that we sold. So it used to be, Peter, that you would call me up and you would say, hey, Marcus, I'm checking out your website. Could you come out to my house and give me a quote for a pool? And I would say, sure. Now, the problem was I never knew how educated you were. I didn't really take the time. I didn't integrate content into the sales process. And so understanding the power of this 30, we started to change it dramatically. Now, what I'm getting ready to show you is how we sell. I'm not saying you would do the exact same thing, but the principle is this. The principle is, can we better integrate content, especially video, as we're going to talk about in the second half, into the sales process before they come to the showroom? Before they come to the showroom. So Peter calls me up and says, hey, Marcus, can you come out to my house this Friday and give me a quote for a pool? And now understanding this, I say, sure, I'd love to, but you're getting ready to spend a lot of money. And if you're going to spend a lot of money, I know you don't want to make any mistakes. And so as to make sure you don't make any mistakes, that's what I'm going to do. As we're talking on the phone right now, I'm going to send you two things that you're going to love. First thing I'm going to send you is a video. The video is going to show you the entire process of the pool being installed in the backyard. And so you're going to see it showing up. You're going to see it going in the ground. You're going to see the cleanup work. You're going to see the whole nine. This way, when I, when, you come out to my, when I come out to your house on Friday, you're not going to say, so Marcus, what does this process look like? You're already going to know. So that just saved me how much time on the sales call? Yeah, that's about 30 minutes so far, I've saved. 30 minutes so far. Now, the other thing I'm going to send you, Peter, is a guide, if you will. It's going to answer all the little nitty-gritty questions that nobody's bothered to answer that you want to know. Like, should I get a cover with my pool? What's the best type of cover? Should I get a heater? What's the best type of heater? Now, it's a little bit long. It's about 30 pages, but I promise it'll be well worth your time. Will you take the time to review those things before our appointment on Friday? And 90% of the time, I get the exact same answer, which is, sure. Does it hurt us to ask them to do this? Yes or no? no? Never hurts. My gracious. And you say, well, what if they don't do it? Many of them won't do it. But if they did do this before they came to the showroom, if somebody says, I want to come to the showroom this Saturday to look at XYZ model, what are we doing in that moment other than saying, yeah, sure, because too often we just accept it and we don't prepare them to be further, way further down the funnel when they actually get to the showroom. Now, this applies, of course, I mean, to everybody in this room in a multiplicity of ways. And so, let me give you a sense for how this changes sales. What I'm getting ready to show you, again, real story. Can't make it up. This is a lead sheet. In other words, when somebody fills out a form on my website, this is the type of information that we see. And we started to see stuff like this all the time, to your point, Tom, a few minutes ago, after we started to integrate content so well into the sales and marketing process. So, this guy's name is William Grizzard. We're going to call him Bill Grizzard, Okay. Now, he did an organic search. It says he was using Yahoo, which is very weird. And then he typed in the phrase, cost of fiberglass pool. Cost of fiberglass pool. Yahoo shows him that article, how much does the fiberglass pool cost? But something very interesting happens next. What happens next? That says total page views. What happens next? He reads how many pages of the website? 370. 375 pages of the website. Tom, what is wrong with Bill Grizzard? <laughs> he, he must be really bored and has way too much time on his hands. That's exactly right. Or maybe he's a competitor. Maybe he's a stalker. Maybe he's got obsessive swimming pool disorder. But either way you shake it, either way you shake it, we can agree. Weird dude, right? Weird, weird, odd behavior. Same night, same night, can't make it up. Get another lead sheet. Turns out Bill has a wife named Joni. And Joni does a search also on Yahoo. So there we have the first identified Yahoo family in America. She searches Richmond, Virginia pools. She proceeds to read 149 pages of the website. So between these two people, how many pages of the site have they now read? 520 some pages. What do you think that sales appointment was like? I walked into the house. 
Bill Grizzard is standing in the living room, I kid you not, with a spreadsheet in his hands. You're like, what is this dude? Accountant, engineer, right? It's got the pool he is getting. It's got every option and accessory he is getting with said, with said pool. And all he needed from me was one little thing, which was the price. And I walked out of that house 45 minutes later, not two and a half hours later, 45 minutes later with a signed contract, $5,000 deposit. And as I drove away, all I could do was laugh because I realized how much selling had I done that day. No, was he past 70%? Yeah, where was he? Yeah, 99.999, Brent, my only job was do not screw this up, pool guy. <laughs> I realized that day, and I've been reminded over and over and over again, that content, assuming it's honest and transparent, and this is the caveat, honest and transparent. None of this stuff works unless you have that type of mindset. I can't help you there. It's the greatest sales and trust building tool in the world. Turns out Bill Grizzard is not a weirdo. Bill Grizzard, can anybody guess what he does for a living? He is a brain surgeon. Yeah. Like that Connor guy earlier, right? Like we're saying, yeah, right, right. That Connor would have read, you know, 350 pages of the site, right? You know, last year we did 135 in-ground fiberglass pools. I know the average number of pages these 135 customers read before they bought because we track everything. We know. We don't make guesses and we don't listen to what the world is saying about these stats. Can anybody guess what the average number of pages our customers read last year was? Anybody want to make a guess? 75, 75 is a great guess, Chris. The number is on the screen. 105. If you had come to me seven, eight years ago and said, Marcus, do you realize your average customer would be willing to read over 100 pages of your website. What do you think I would have told you? You're crazy. You don't understand my business. You don't understand my industry. You don't understand my sales process. And I would have been dead wrong because I would have been underestimating the power of great teaching, great listening, willingness to think like a buyer. I'm asking you to think like a buyer. I'm asking you to be willing to become the Wikipedia of your space, even if it's hard sometimes to address those questions. And I promise you, if you do that, you're going to get incredible results. Now, the cool thing is this. You get to go eat lunch, but we're not done. Because we have 45 minutes of video conversation after lunch. And I tell you, even though many of you are doing video, you are going to be flooded with ideas of videos that you can produce, your dealers can produce as a supplier, what you can be producing to get amazing results over the coming years. Give yourselves a big round of applause. Marcus, thank you for a wonderful first portion. The, uh, the second half will be fantastic. I'm looking forward. You came back. Oh my goodness, I can't believe I fooled you guys. So the slide issue is this. I should have told you I will give you a copy of the slides. Ah, should have told you that. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you won't hold that against me. And uh, same, with these next, same with this next group. Um, everybody have a good lunch? Everybody have a good lunch? Yeah. So really quick, really quick, just so I can um, feel good about myself inside. Can somebody tell me one thing that you've heard so far today in my presentation that you're like, you know what, we really should do that or we could do that better. We need to apply that thing. Just give me one thing. Anybody go. Give me something. Okay. So we're going to add, you're going to add some marketing people. It's good. It's like his marketing department is nobody. Yeah, it's good, Ned. So let's, let's start with getting one person and that's a good way to go. Yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah, so I'm stop. Yeah, yeah. They, my man laid them off this morning. We rehired them. We're going to cause the numbers to shift. Yes, yeah. Did, more is better than less, especially if we think of it like the buyer. Love it, Don. Thank you so much for that. Yes, my man. Obsess over the questions you're asking. Obsess, and that's, which is different than just hear them or listen to them. Obsess over them because they'll tell us so much of what we need to know. Anybody else have, uh, my man, yeah. Be the Wikipedia of your Be the Wikipedia of your space. Yeah, and right now, 
if you know you ask uh, a, a consumer in our space who is the Wikipedia of this space, the fact is, you know, they, they probably would say the whole truth. They they really would. I know that's what I would say just because that seems to be the place where everybody's gone to get their answers up to this point. And you can be that as well for your organization. Welcome. Okay, so I want to jump into this important subject. See how good you are. They say by the year 2019, which is how many months away? Eight. By the year 2019, what percentage of content consumed online by buyers, consumers, is going to be video-based content? Take a guess, anybody. What percentage do you think it is? Okay. Oh, you're so good. You're so good. 80%. 80%. Cisco made up this stat, and this is the reality. So when you see this, when you look at this, Quickly, what comes to your mind? Anything, just what's your, you're thinking about your business, we're here to think about the, what comes to your mind about you and your business and about what you might need to do when you see that number? Anybody, come on. Yeah, go ahead. We're behind. We're, we're behind. Because, because if we did, let's say, text or images versus video, for most of us in this room, video might constitute, and this is not everybody, I'm just generally speaking, 5 to 15% of our total content. And so we need to flip that, don't we, to match and stay ahead of today's buyer. Great point. Anybody else have a thought when you see that? Yes, sir. Question about the quality of the content that's video. We're competing. Okay, this is, yeah. This, yeah, Robert, this is so good. This is so good. Um, so I wish we had three hours just to talk about video, but I will say this. When somebody's getting started, generally speaking, we say there's two elements to video. There's the production and then there's the, in other words, there's the way that it looks, and then there's the way that it sounds, all right? Now, the way that it looks, people can, are much more forgiving in terms of the way that it looks. So generally with our customers, because we've trained companies all over the world how to have an in-house video culture. I've trained at least 40 videographers, my company has, over the last two or three years. And I can tell you this, that we try to set the bar at a seven out of 10 with the videos at first in terms of the visual product. We set the bar at a nine out of 10 audio because the brain is unforgiving when it comes to bad audio. You'll get out quick, but you'll put up with something that isn't incredibly visual if you're learning. But if your brain is getting frustrated, it's out. You know, when I see this, a couple things come to mind, okay? Number one, you, me, we, we are all media companies. Whether we want to admit it or not. You know, I'm a media company that happens to sell pools. I'm a media company that happens to speak. I'm a media company that happens to have a sales and marketing company. But all three are media companies. That's what they are. And the moment you say we're a media company that happens to sell what we sell, then it shifts. It said you, you're able to say things like, yeah, of course we should have a full-time videographer on staff and not just outsource our video. That's an example of that shift. Some of you in this room have made that shift to having an in-house full-time videographer. And trust me, it is, especially for manufacturers and many of you suppliers in this room, it is minimum part-time, but for most in this room, it's easily full-time, easily, as you're going to see here in a second, easily. Now, another uh, stat that I want to uh, talk to you. Let's talk about social media for a second. Many of you are starting to mess around with that a little bit. Social media video, or video on social, generates what percentage more shares than text and images combined? You might have a guess. The percentage that social video generates in terms of shares, engagement, over text and regular photos. Say 100? Good guess. The answer is 1,200%. What does that number mean to you? <laughs> he said close. Yeah, within 1,100. Not bad. Not bad. So what does that mean to you? What does it mean? When you see that number, what does it mean? Come on. It all has to come back to us. Otherwise, we're just having fun, right? What does it mean, Chris? Quit posting pictures or post videos. Quit posting necessarily photos. And now, granted, we can photo still because we have such a visual, photos can do really, really well. But to me, and you're, you're dead on, but to me, essentially, this means this. We don't have social media unless we're doing video. 
at this point. And you've seen, I don't even waste my time sharing articles any longer on social media. And I used to share tons. I don't even do it now. I only post video. That's it. That's it. Because there's only so much energy that you have, and you want to get the biggest bang for your buck. But if you don't have that media mentality, well, then it's going to be very difficult to have this type of mindset. Fact is, most of us in this room should be producing, and I only say this based on the number of companies we've worked with. Our average client produces three to four videos a week. A week. You might say that sounds like a lot. Here's the thing. 80% of the videos you produce are probably just going to be general education style videos that are not super high production, incredibly intensive with drones and with all that other stuff. Maybe 10 to 20% is going to be more of that time investment. But the majority should be something that a salesperson could shoot in 20 minutes in an afternoon. But if we don't have that videographer, man, is it tough. It really, really is tough. Many of you are outsourcing your video. I'm telling you, what you're spending outsourcing versus what you could do in sourcing, it is phenomenal, the difference. Phenomenal. And I want to save you money. I want to save you money. And so you can have a videographer in-house. So our average videographer that we, when we like are working with a company and, and we're, we help them hire them. And so the salary range for most is in that 40 to 55 range. Now, if you outsource your video, does anybody know how quickly you're going to reach $50,000? Couple days. <laughs> Couple days, because you've been there, right, Peter? You've been there. You, you, you already know. You already know. And so the point is, we got to think differently. Now, this is how we got to think. I'm going to drive this home. If we don't show it, it doesn't exist. The question is, what is it? But we're going to talk about what it is. But everything we claim, Dan, our mindset is, or should be, have I shown it yet? If I make the claim about my company, about my people, about my product, about my service, have I shown it? Because if I haven't shown it, it's not real, as we're going to see. Now, here's what's fun. I'm going to talk about now eight videos that you can produce. If you produce these eight types of videos, it will, my promise to you, have a dramatic impact on your brand, on your bottom line. It's going to generate a lot of revenue. Your dealers are going to love it. For you suppliers, it's going to increase big time in terms of the number of contacts you get. This will be your best salesperson if you do it the right way. All right? So let's look at them together. Video number one, the 80% video. You talk to any salesperson in the world, doesn't matter the industry, it's fascinating. You talk to any salesperson and you say, what percentage of the questions you get on a first sales call, assuming it's the same product or service, are essentially the same questions every single time, what do you think most salespeople are going to say? Go ahead. 80%. In other words, four out of five questions we get on a traditional sales call are essentially the same questions if you lined up 10 straight customers. And so the question is, as we kind of joked about this earlier, why do we continue to answer these same questions over and over again. We're wasting so much time of our team. It hurts morale. And so we can change this very much. So how do you do this? You get your sales team together, and you have each one choose a specific product or service that you offer. And you say, when we have a sales call, what are the top 10 questions we get from that particular product or service almost every single time. Have them do at least 10. Now, you might have a group on your team that does this all for one product and you come up with 20 different questions. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to choose the top seven. Once you have those seven, you produce a video on each one. doesn't need to be long, but you want to thoroughly answer the question as concisely as possible. If that means 30 seconds, great. If that means two minutes, totally fine. So you do an individual video on all seven questions, and then at the end, you mash up those, and you form one video that now your sales team use every single time they get a prospect into the system. Are you tracking me so far? Am I making sense? Say yes if you're with me. 
Okay, good. So this is what I want to do. And please, let's take this seriously because we have a limited amount of time. So let's make sure we get a bunch out of it. Everybody's got this top seven questions uh, card here on the desk right now. Let's challenge ourselves and why don't you do this? I want you to choose one major product or service that you offer. All right? One major product or service that you offer within your company. I want you as quickly as you can to write down seven questions that you generally get almost every single time you have a sales call for that one. Does that make sense? Okay. Do your best. The first one done, raise your hand. First one that's done, raise your hand. On your mark, it said go. Thank you, bud. All right, a few of you off to the races. Doing great. See, some of you have mastered shorthand very well. Very well. Okay, we got six here. Ooh. Good stuff. It's funny how so many of you are basically saying the five subjects we talked about this morning. Isn't that funny? Keep going. Keep going. Knock them out, Matthew. Knock them out. You got your seven yet? She stole my phone. Oh, she, oh, blame it on the lady. That's what the guys always do. Good job over here. Whoa, Grant. That's pretty darn good. Jim, did you get him? You're a speaker. How you doing, man? Good, good luck you. later. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Got it, guys? You doing all right? Bear? I don't Barry. Not breaking a record over there. I don't know what those rhyme words are, but I know what that means. The questions that you get every time you are talking to a prospect, like the standard. Almost every single time you talk to somebody, they're going to answer a certain, ask a certain set of questions. <laughs> the most repeated questions you get. Okay. Raise your hand if you're done. Raise your hand if you're done. Got a few here. Don't be shy. All it means is you know your customer. Jeez. Nothing wrong with that. Jeff, got it? Good? All right. Now, everybody go ahead and stop. Really quick. Very, very quickly. I need your help. As you were doing that, that activity, what went through your mind? Anybody go. What went through your mind? Okay, yeah, there's like, whoa, there's so many more than that if you really know your customer. There's so many more than that. So the beauty behind this is you want to take the core ones, Phil. They get, and you don't have to stick with seven. You could do 10 or maybe even 12. But it's the core, common, most common questions that we want them to know before they walk into the showroom or before we have that sales call or whatever that thing is. Makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. All right. Anybody else have any observations really quickly about that activity? If you create this in terms of or in form of a video, it will have a dramatic impact on your sales process. All right, let's do the next one. Most underutilized element of your sales team's marketing right now is their email signature. Email signatures are incredibly powerful. Most companies do not take advantage of them. One great way to take advantage of them is to put a bio video in your email signature. So what's a bio video? It basically just talks about the person, it's the person talking about themselves, and says, hey, I'm Marcus, I'm with XYZ Company, here's why I'm here, here's what I do, here's why I love this industry, and when I'm not here, these are the things that I do for fun. So you have some professional, you have some personal, maybe it's 60 to 90 seconds, but here's how it would look. So let's say you have an email signature, and this is one of my employees right here, his name's Zach. So his signature is here, and it says, well, I'm in your inbox. Who exactly is this Basner guy? Is it true that he's related to Paul Revere? Probably not. So he has a little bit of fun with it, but what's amazing about this is this. We have found that if a salesperson sends out a decent amount of emails, just generally speaking, as part of their job, we've had certain case studies where they received over 100 views a month to their email signature video. The whole idea here is can they get to know us sooner 
than they already do. Because this much I know, if they're meeting your team when they come into the showroom, we're losing. The idea is that the relationship has started before the showroom or before the sales call, before the handshake, before the initial meeting. That's not the time that they say, oh, that's what he looks like. Makes sense. That's number two. Number three, product service page videos. The idea is that, and many of you are doing this well, every single major page of the website should have at least one video specific to that particular product or service. Here's what's great. If you do an 80% video for each one of those, it oftentimes acts as this. Now, here's the key, though. When you do a product or service video for anything that you have. And this is so hard for so many to understand and so stinking true. You not only want to say who it's for the product or service and what it does, but you want to discuss who it's not for, who doesn't need it, who shouldn't purchase it. Does anybody know why that is? The moment somebody actually says to you, this is not a good fit for you if, and we're going to look at this in more detail in a second, to the ones that you are a good fit for, you become way more attractive. Makes sense. So there's product service pages. Number four, number four, landing page videos. So your landing pages are any pages on your site right now that have a form, something that somebody can fill out. So when you're getting ready to fill out a form, you, on other websites, when you're doing your normal searching stuff, what is the emotion you experience when you get ready to fill out a form? Anxiety. Why? Because you're getting ready to give them something and you don't know what. What are they going to do with it, Joan? Are they going to bombard me with emails? Is somebody going to stalk me? Am I going to get a call this second? Am I going to get a call like... Like every five minutes from the salesperson, not that anybody in this industry would do that, but they want to know these things. So there's a certain amount of fear and anxiety. What eliminates, and if you ever do, if you ever look at the analytics on your website, this will blow you away. The amount of people that go to your contact us page that has the form that don't fill it out is mind blowing. And so what can we do to elevate that? Because just that conversion can explode your sales revenue. What we do is we put a video next to the form that explains if you fill out this form, so it might sound like this. All right, I'm just going to do it like I, I would in the video. Okay, so you're sitting there saying, should I fill out this form right now? I get it, and I understand First off, let me say, we're not going to bombard you with emails. In fact, we have a rule that you're only allowed to call the people, or whatever your rule is, you literally tell them what that is. And then you might say, like I have on my site, you might say, we're going to call you within 48 hours or email you within a certain amount of time. If you don't receive or hear from us during that time, we've tried and somehow there's an error, please contact us back. But just by doing this, you can overcome some of those concerns. Here's where it gets fascinating. We have found that if you have a video that helps eliminate those concerns next to the form, that it can increase conversions by 80%. And that, my friends, is a massive number in terms of potential quotes that you might be giving or whatever that thing is, whatever that thing is. Any questions about that? Please stop me. Please stop me. Now's the time. Number five. Number five. Customer journey videos. Customer journey videos. So many of us might have quick testimonials that show somebody talking about our stuff. But we oftentimes don't show the journey. In other words, people like me saying, so there I was, me and my son, wanting to find out, okay, what's the offshore boat? And I spent all this time looking. 
and I was afraid of this and this. And I didn't understand this and this. But I knew I needed this and this. And so because of that, I looked at this and this. But finally, I came to those guys, and this is what happened. And we got the boat. And what happened after we got the boat? Well, let me tell you about what happened from there. And this is where we are today. So you start with where they were, the issues, the fears, the problems that they had. You talk about the process they went through, and then you talk about where they are today. It's been around since the beginning of storytelling. It's a hero's journey, and we can all do it too with our case studies, but most of us don't do it with our customer case studies. Include the hero's journey for them because they're your hero. They're your customer, right? Number six, number six, the claims we make. The claims we make. Ooh, love this one. Y'all make any claims around here? We love to make claims. We love to make claims. So I'm going to do a quick test. I want you to flip your card over. Flip your card over. Everybody participate now. Everybody participate. So what I want you to do is write down five claims you make about your company. Now, this could be about a particular product, a particular element of your service. It could be we're the best this. It could be we use this particular product and we're the, we're the most innovative here. But I want you to write down five claims you make about your company, your, your, your product, your service, your event, whatever that thing is. Choose five. Some of you are really close to finishing this one. You're doing great. Actually, I said five. It's only four, so I'll let you off easy. Got it? You got it, Charlie. I went to your side. How do you pronounce that? Tig or is it T? Tiger. Tiger. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. <clears throat> I like that, man. Are you a tiger? Yeah. All right. I have a tiger. Yeah, I got it. Okay, now, as you were doing that activity, what, if anything, went through your mind? What were you thinking about? Come on. Come on, Sonny. What's that, Joan? Beating the clock. Beating the clock. Oh, <laughs> trying to beat the clock? Yeah, <laughs> trying to beat the clock. What else went through your mind? Come on. What went through your mind? System solutions. Okay. What do you mean by that? You said system solutions. We'll, we'll solve your problems. Okay, we'll solve your problems. We had one over here. Yeah. Oh, oh, Jay, man, now we're thinking. So really quick, let me pull up. Um, some of you do, like, I was really fascinated by some of the claims that you were making on your sites. Like, I was very into it. Let me give you an example. Uh, Monterey, you in here? Where's Monterey? Raise your hand. Oh, my man. Love what you're doing on your site. So many great things. So many great things. This is a perfect example of, and a lot of us have something like this, but you notice you've got five major claims here. So you've got these five major claims and this is going to lead us to another question. So you did a great job there. Now, the question is, of course, though, are we showing them? So this is what I want you to do on your list. The first thing I want you to do on your list that you just made, I want you to put, I want you to put a check mark next to one that any of your competitors also say. All right? So put a check mark next to it if any of your competitors also say it. Just it, one. It, 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 next to it, all of them. In other words, if they all four, put four check marks, if none of them, none of your competitors say a particular claim, then it's no, nothing there. Okay? So that's the, um, that's the first part. So give me an example of somebody of one that you know, like, yeah, my competitors say this too. Somebody give me something. Okay? Joan says, we offer the best ride. We're the best. Yeah, the best ride. 
Who else makes that claim? Come on, let's be honest. Y'all are not being honest right now. I'm glad Tom's here. Otherwise, we might have a lack of integrity in the room. How many of you say we offer the best ride? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay, so we got a bunch of more honest people now. Good, good. Now, if everybody in an industry says the same thing, what does it mean to the marketplace? Doesn't mean anything until what? Until it's proven. And how is it proven? It is shown. It doesn't mean anything until we show it. Here's another cool thing that I saw. Now, I thought this was great. C. Ray, where are you at? Raise your hand, C. Ray. My man. All right. Now, what was great behind this is you said, okay, so we've got this whole science behind the quiet ride. So I'm like, okay. Now, a lot of people just taking the time to explain it, but this is what's so great about what you did. What's your name, by the way? I'm sorry. Scott, what was so cool for me, Scott, is that on yours, it says, see the science. Ha! Ah, now, I was all in on that junk. Whoosh! Dove right in. Show me why you're quiet. And now, it was so much more believable than everybody else that says, we have an incredibly quiet ride. Because you said, see the science. You didn't just say see it. You said see the science. I'm like, dude, your copy is killing me. It's awesome. That was a great job. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. 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 Everybody catching the vision? Catching it? Good. Number seven. I want to hit this one individually because it's such a big deal. Who we are not a good fit for. So I'm going to put you on the spot for a second. Peter. We've become friends now. We ate lunch together. Okay? You don't hate me too much, so I'm going to ask you this question. If you had to say, without being snarky, who a Bertram is not for, and let's assume they want a boat, but you had to describe somebody that would not be a good fit for it, what might that sound like? Someone who boats in shallow waters. Perfect. So if you know that you're going to do a lot of shallow water boating or fishing, a Bertram might not be the best choice for you because our average draw is this much, and so you need to consider that during your purchase process. And so you've got to still explain it because shallow to some might be six feet, which is deep enough. Shallow to others might be six inches, so we need to explain it. Good one. What's another example of a bullet point of who a Bertram might not be a good fit for? Man, this is so hard, Marcus. I mean, you know, if they breathe, you know. You know, a casual boater. He's struggling so much. This is so great. This is so great. Now, now here's the thing, Peter. I, I, and I'm not being silly when I say this. This is the question that I want you to obsess over. Because if you can message this the right way, man, you become so attractive to the ones who do align with what you offer. Makes sense, yep. right? And so most in your space are never going to be willing to do what I just said. I mean, that's the sad reality of what I'm talking about today. You know, I taught what, were, what you're seeing before I started speaking to the world on this. I spoke to the swimming pool industry. And I once did the math. I taught, taught at the National Swimming Pool and Hot Tub Convention for four years before I became a professional speaker. Everything that you've heard me say for the most part today, other than the video stuff, for the most part, I gave to my closest competitors, showed them everything we had done, showed them how we did they ask you answer, I mean the whole nine. So I figured I've taught over 1,200 swimming pool companies what you've heard today, what made us the most traffic swimming pool company in the world. Out of the 1,200, guess how many have done it even half as well as we did it at River Pools? Maybe one. And of course, what's the reason for that? Why? Because you can take a horse to water. I mean, I am trying to grab your hands and stand over the puddle with you this morning. Number eight. Okay. 
Question. Yes, sir. Tom. Well, I'll answer one of the questions that he was in research in. Okay, great. Not experience. Man, that's such a good one because, man, this is great. I know some of you as had a, It sounds kind of snarky. No, it's not because there's a whole reason that I started with a skiff and then I went to a 16-foot simple bay liner that was used. It cost me 4000 bucks. Then I got a 40000 on dollar boat that was 23 feet and now I'm going to 10x that probably somehow so in terms of cost but I didn't feel comfortable and it would have swallowed me up if I had gotten a 35 foot boat from the beginning it would have just crushed me but I would have trusted you so much if you had told me that because when I do come back for that 35 now I know who is going to be real with me so great point number eight how we do what we do. The myth of the secret sauce. When I started doing video in the, in the swing pool industry, we were still buying our pools from someone else. And, a, and the company we were using is called Leisure Fiberglass Pools, still around. They had a big dealer meeting, and I came in as this, I don't know, I was probably 31 years old, something like that. And I started shooting videos of the manufacturing process, and they freaked out. <laughs> what are you doing? What do you mean? You can't show this? I'm like, what? what? I mean, you don't want people to see this? Well, we have proprietary techniques that we use. And, of course, all their employees have been employees from other manufacturers, and they're all just interbreeding. I mean, come on. <laughs> Yet they acted like they had this secret sauce, which we all know is Thousand Island dressing. That's correct, Thousand Island. So what are the things that truly are secret sauce versus just stuff that we do, but others do it as well? Now, you don't have to answer that, but I want you to think about it. Can I truly see, for example, if you're in manufacturing, can I truly see how you manufacture right now? Can I truly see why your metal is better? My man said rust earlier. Who said rust? Who was my rust guy? It was Matthew, right? You know, I shouldn't say this, but they're not here. In my boat, my hardware rusted out hard within the first year. I, I was shocked. I'm sure you do. That's because you're awesome. But the question is, why didn't I know before that? Why didn't I know to ask the dealer about the hardware that the manufacturer had put in? Do you know what I'm saying? I just didn't know. And I'm not saying you did it wrong, man. You're doing a lot of things great. But you see, these are the types of things that we need to think about. Could I see? Now, we at River Pools recently created a series of eight videos average of 10 minutes long each that literally shows our entire manufacturing process to the point where if you wanted to start a manufacturing um, company for fiberglass pools, you could probably kick it off by watching these videos. We just released it. Put it out there. Types of cleaners we use, we show them. Types of chemicals we use, we show it all. Everything we show. But here's what's so fascinating. We have a massive percentage of homeowners and dealers that have said, you're the only one that's willing to show the whole thing and really show it. The amount of people that watch 80 minutes of video is shocking to me. But again, they want to feel safe like Bill Grizzard. They want to feel comfortable. Your customers do too. So don't hesitate to show the thing. Now, some of you are, are, man, you're doing some great things here. And I know this is also why you're obsessed with bringing them to the showroom. Tom and I talked about this a ton of, at lunch. Yes, the showroom is massive. It's huge in terms of the sales process. It's the ultimate closer. Man, if they're close, if we get them to the showroom, we're going to bring it home. I don't disagree with that at all. The question is, is it possible to bring the feeling of the showroom to them. Is it possible? And you might say, no way, it's not possible because it's not the same. 
We also said we would never buy a car without test driving it first. Yet today, CarMax sells thousands of cars a month without anybody test driving the vehicle. Auto dealers would have said impossible 20 years ago. Today, standard. Standard. I think we can create that magic. Might not be the same, but maybe it's enough magic to make them say, yeah, I'll spend the money to come and fly out to the facility. Some of you have done a great job with this. Regal, you in here? Raise your hand, Regal. All right, my man. Love what you're doing, right? So Regal's got a lot, I mean, and many of you are doing this. I just, I just chose today ones that I just was, you know, any, anybody that I brought up today is because you're doing something that I was impressed with. I, didn't, I couldn't bring up everybody. But they've got, of course, you can sign up here. But what's cool about this is they've got a great video on this page that shows me, oh, my goodness. So they've got all of the models from the smallest to the biggest in the showroom. And you explain why I should come. That's awesome. That was great. We have another one here. I'm going to um, show you what Joan has done. This is really, I, I saw this. A few months ago, I was begging Joan to do video. Now, all of a sudden, she just is like, my man, you ready, Brian? All right, I'm going to watch the first minute or so. Welcome to Regulator. We're glad you've joined Look us today for woman. a factory tour. Today, we're going to walk you through all the processes of how we build the incredible boats that you come to know as Regulators. So let's take the tour. All right, now stop right there. Welcome to the... Now, Brian, jump to the final minute, if you would, okay? Are trained by Yamaha, so the only people that touch these engines are ones that know exactly what to do. As we begin the final stages of delivering this incredible boat to you, we have our team of customer inspectors come aboard and take a look as if they were buying it for themselves. They open the hatches, they open the doors, they check the finish of the boat as if this very boat was their own. And once they've completed that and they've said it's time for the boat to ship, then we wrap it up and we send it to your local dealer and to you. We loved having you tour our facility, but what we really want is for you to come to 187 Peanut Drive, the home of Regulator Marine in Edenton, North Carolina, and take a tour of our facility. We would love to show you what we do, but more importantly, we want to introduce you to the craftsmen who built every single regulator we built. Have a great day and come see us in Edenton. What do you think, huh? Why the heck? Give a round of applause, yeah. Now. That's my wife. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Hey, hey, only, at least somebody in the family had a face for the camera. Right, brother? <laughs> right, right? So, so, I mean, here's what's so cool. We have the owner of the company gets up there, and does she seem warm to you? Does, does it just make you want to come to the showroom? Some of you might say to yourself, if I show it, well, then they won't have incentive to come. And I understand that fear. I really, really do. And maybe some will say, yeah, I saw it all. But I would argue that more will want to come and partake of that goodness that is your culture, your people, your standards of excellence. That's my argument. I know that's what's possible for you. Video, again, it's not going to slow down. It's not going to go away. Many of you in this room already get that. I've been so impressed with some of the videos that I saw. Let's keep it going, but always think about and obsess about what are also the things that I don't understand that you're showing. What could I see more of in this moment? The little things can go such a long ways. My final thoughts. Final thoughts. Here's those videos again. My hope is that you do them. Now, last story I want to share with you is I was once speaking in Dallas, Texas, and... I was, um, I was approached by a reporter after I was done. And the reporter said, Marcus, this, this, this story about your swimming pool company and how you saved it is so interesting. I think I want to do a story in the paper. And I said, sure. 
yeah, whatever, whatever you want. I didn't think anything of it until we talked on the phone a few days later for 90 minutes. And then a few days after that, they sent a photographer down to my swimming pool company. And then a few days after that, on the cover of the small business section of the New York Times appeared this article right here. Now, there's two ironies to this if you look real close. Now, look close. Two ironies. First one is this. That shirt makes me look fat. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You were thinking that, Peter, weren't you? Right? Right? I know. That's the day I went from stripes to solids, brother. You get that? <laughs> get that? But here's a serious one. Here's a serious one. Look at the title. A revolutionary marketing strategy. Answer customers' questions. Well, daggum, New York Times, you have outdone yourself with that one. Is there anything revolutionary about answering your customers' questions? In principle, well, no. But in practice, hopefully, you realize, yes. This became the number one shared and emailed story for the Times for the next three days. They re-ran it again that Saturday. And over the coming months, I got over a thousand emails from business owners, marketers around the globe. I had no idea the Times had this much influence. And almost all of them said one of two things in, their, in these emails. It was fascinating. First thing they said is, that thing you did with your pool company was so simple. I hope you feel like nothing I've said this morning is incredibly complex. I really do. But as you've heard, it's oftentimes by the simple things are great things brought to pass. And the second thing they said was, Marcus, I feel like you've given me permission to do that which I have always felt we should be doing. I am just asking you to treat them as you yourself in that moment of fear and doubt and worry and concern that you would want to be treated. That rule works. It's worked for a few thousand years. It will not stop. I promise you that. So our challenge is this. Let's become the best teachers in the world, shall we? Let's obsess over the questions that they're asking. Let's overcome the technology hurdles and see ourselves as media companies. Embrace digital instead of fighting it. Embrace how the buyer has changed instead of resisting it. And if we do that, I can assure you everything will change. You have been awesome. Thank you very much. Marcus Sheridan, everybody. Thank you.